Well, welcome everybody to, I think, the third edition of the um, Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association and UVM Extension webinar series for this winter and spring. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about promoting pollinator vigor in cut flower production. And uh, we'll, we have two presenters today, and uh, Lynn Adler and Karen Trubit of to uh, True Love Farm. Um, and Lynn is from uh, UMass, University of Massachusetts. And um, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, during the presentations, if you could stay muted, that would be wonderful. And uh, any questions or comments that come up would be, um, might be good to put those in the chat or you can just hold on to them until um, we have time for questions and discussion. And I think those are kind of all the housekeeping pieces I wanted to mention. And if you also would like to introduce yourselves in the chat with your name and um, your, your state that you're in and maybe what farm you're from or um, whatever your work is, that would uh, be fun to see in the chat just to get to know who's here since we're here virtually instead of in person. And so I think with that, I'm going to, um, we'll start out with Dr. Lynn Adler and her presentation. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak at, um, in this seminar today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so my name is Lynn Adler. I'm at UMass Amherst. I'm actually an evolutionary ecologist who studies plant insect interactions. So my sort of perspective in coming to this work is more from the desire to kind of understand how plants and pollinators and diseases interact. But recently my work has had um, some relevance for farmers, people growing cut flowers and others. And so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to get to talk with all of you. I like to start by something that maybe many of us can relate to. We've all been on a lot too many Zoom meetings perhaps for the last couple of years and we may be familiar with that idea that yeah, hopefully all of us are familiar with the um, experience of having getting a headache. And we might take something like aspirin to treat that headache, being perhaps not so aware that the primary, the active ingredient of aspirin is methyl salicylic acid. It's actually produced by willow bark. Um, and willows don't make this compound to help us treat our headaches. Plants are amazing chemists that make a huge range of compounds to help protect themselves against their own um, their own predators, their own pests, their own pathogens. But we as humans have figured out how to use small amounts of many of these compounds to treat our own diseases. So we regularly use plant defenses as medicine. And um, the research I'd like to talk about now was inspired by starting out to wondering if pollinators can do this as well. Another way of kind of thinking about this is um, considering the role that plant communities might play in affecting pollinator health. So if we have a bee and she's out foraging, she's visiting a bunch of different plants. They might be the same species, they might be different species, and she's getting a lot of different things. A lot of different things are happening because of her choices um, and those interactions. So certainly the first thing we think of is food. Um, these are getting, I was a little punchy when I picked these pictures, but they're getting both protein, um, and fats from pollen, as well as sugars, carbohydrates from nectar, and that bee might be using them for her own nutrition or to provision her offspring. But I'm putting forth this idea that bees maybe in some circumstances could get something we might think of as medicine. Can bees also get rewards, floral resources that might help reduce their own diseases? And a third potential consequence of these interactions might be, is this also nature's toilet bowl? Uh, or maybe more like a rest stop. So bees are visiting flowers. Lots of them are visiting. They are feeding, but they may also be defecating, spreading germs. And so another consequence of visiting flowers might be that these become hot spots of sort of high activity. And we've learned a lot about how diseases get transmitted in the last few years and places where organisms come together, eat, share germs and then disperse are really common models for thinking about disease spread. In my lab, we don't really study the nutritional aspects as much, but we do look at the potential of floral resources to play a role as medicine and also the possibility of flowers being possible toilet bowls or places where germs might get spread. So the players I particularly work with um, are 
Mostly the scientific name is Bombus impatiens. Um, it's the common Eastern bumblebee. It is by far the most common bumblebee in the entire East Coast. Uh, we work with it for a variety of reasons. One of them is that they're commercially reared. This is, if you're purchasing bumblebees to pollinate your crops, this is the bumblebee you'd be getting. Um, that also makes it nice for us to work with because we can get colonies all year long for experiments. I also like to acknowledge though, this bumblebee is doing great. This bumblebee is not one of the species that's in decline. We use this as a model system to understand um, interactions more generally, but this is actually a bumblebee that has been increasing while other species have been declining. Um, however, because it is so predominant, it is still the case that interactions that are happening in this bee species may then drive dynamics in other bees when those pathogens get transmitted between bee species. We work mostly with this lovely pathogen. It's called Crithidia bombi. I'm sorry to say it doesn't have a common name. I'm just going to call it Crithidia. It is a gut parasite. It's related to pathogens that cause Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, African sleeping sickness in humans. Um, and it's transmitted when an infected bee defecates, there's infective cells in the feces. If another bee consumes those cells, then that bee can get infected as well. Um, it's not the baddest of the bad as pathogens go, but it does reduce lifespan, reduce colony reproduction, reduce the odds that a queen is going to survive the wintering and found a new colony. So it does have a range of negative effects and it can be exceedingly common where we are, we can find it in some years in up to 80% of the bumblebees in our area. And frequently when people screen for pathogens, Crithidia is kind of at the top of the list in, how, in terms of how common it is, not necessarily in how severe the impacts are. So what we know uh, in this nature's medicine cabinet role, um, I am going to tell you and then show you some data. We've discovered that sunflower pollen actually does this amazing job of reducing infection in these bumblebees. The way we typically do these kinds of experiments is we start by taking a bunch of individual bees, putting them in separate vials or containers, and we start out by exposing them all to the disease. So we inoculate all the bees with the same dose of Crithidia to start with. If we want to find out what makes a bee better, we need to start out by making them sick. So expose everybody to the same level to begin with, and then we randomly assign them to their different diets, pollen diets in this case. We tried sunflower pollen, a rape, essentially canola pollen, buckwheat pollen, um, or a mix of all three. And we feed them those diets for seven days and then dissect them and look at how intense the infections are in the gut. This actually started as an honors undergrad project. And I asked the student how it was going. And he said, it's amazing. When we feed these bees sunflower pollen, they just really don't have an infection anymore. So you can see buckwheat results in pretty high infections, canola and sort of moderate, but bees fed sunflower, just most of them have no discernible infection. The few that do have extremely low counts. A mix was effective, but not as effective as just sunflower pollen. This has been a result that has been very repeatable across many experiments, um, very robust. Due to time, I'd love to sort of show you more data, but due to time, I'm just going to tell you more things about this. We, after that initial result, we found that pollen from many different kinds of sunflower has the same effect. Of course, cut flower sunflowers often don't produce pollen. Um, there is some work suggesting that actually honey from sunflowers though reduces another pathogen in honeybees. But we found that if you are planting sort of cover crop or oil seed sunflowers, you can do them almost pretty much any different kind and it will all have this effect. Uh, it's nice to show things in the lab, but we're interested in what happens on farms. And we have put out bumblebee colonies at 20 different farms in Western Mass and found that more sunflower results in bumblebees with lower infection and higher reproduction. So colonies at farms with more sunflower both had less infection and they made more daughter queens, suggesting that planting sunflowers could actually have impacts on bee health and dynamics in the field. We're wondering whether this is even something effect that might be broader than just sunflowers. And so we have looked at the pollen of um, six out of eight other plants in the sunflower family and found that they also reduced infection, which makes us excited that this could be something even broader than just sunflowers. Which, um, so what, what we know, sunflower pollen dramatically reduces crithidia infection. This then links to, I think many of you as cut flower farmers, wood increasing sunflower family cut flowers on farm reduce infection. An awful lot of the plants, basically if it looks like a daisy or a sunflower, it's in that same family. Zinnias, dahlias, cosmos, agaratum, 
daisies, echinaceas, black-eyed Susans, coreopsis, these are all in that same family. And so we got a grant from the Northeastern Sayre uh, this past summer to look at whether growing more of these other cut flowers might also have infections. It was a relatively small scale grant. We just did six farms this past summer. I'm sorry to say the data are the data. Um, so far, we don't see a ton of evidence that cut flowers reduce pathogen infection on farms. I would say we haven't finished analyzing our data. Uh, we're still working our way through it, but I don't see the farm that we have the picture of here planted two acres of like zinnias and cosmos and all kinds of stuff. And I don't see that the bees at that farm had dramatically lower infection than any of the others. I know that's not what we want to hear, but the data are the data. Sunflowers definitely work. Other cut flowers, mm, not so sure yet, but I wouldn't say that we've got the final answer on that. Um, I'd also like to, um, broaden this out a little bit to think about the role that plant species might play in their ability to transmit diseases to bees more generally. We've done this by um, letting bees forage on different plants that are often used in pollinator friendly uh, plantings, pollinator friendly habitat. Um, we start by actually inoculating the plants with gravity with this pathogen, putting little droplets of pathogen on the flowers and letting bees forage and then taking those bees back to the lab and rearing them to see, did they get infected or not? If so, how bad was the infection? And we compared this on 14 different plant species, many of which were on sort of pollinator friendly lists, some of which were invasive species or horticultural species we were interested in. Um, but this was a pretty big project a few years ago. And I'm gonna show you some results here. Each bar here is a different plant and there's sort of like a three letter key for who that plant is. And I know y'all go, well, what are these? And ask me at the end, I'm happy to tell you. And this is sort of how infected, the y-axis is basically average infection in bees that forage on that plant species. And if you squint, what I kind of like you to see is that it seems like there's some plants that really don't transmit a lot of infection when bees visit them. And there's other plants that I might call high transmission plants where bees are really likely to pick up infection when they forage on those plants. I'll point out H-E-L is helianthus, that sunflower. It's one of the low um, ones, thyme, uh, snapdragons, uh, foxglove, jewelweed, some of our low transmission plants. Um, excuse me, this keeps. So what did we do next? Again, it's kind of nice to see that there might be differences in transmission, but does that actually mean that what we plant in wildflower strips or pollinator habitat could actually affect disease in bee colonies. We did this experiment intending to sort of simulate an agricultural context. We put bees in tents using canola as a crop. And then we had three treatments. Some of the tents just had canola with no wildflower strip. Some had canola and a strip of high transmission plants. And some had canola and a strip of low transmission plants. We then put an infected bee colony in that tent and let it forage for two weeks on those plants and then assess that bee colony to see how well it did and how much infection it has. Um, this paper came out last year. We were very excited about it. Just, I always find it helpful to see what things actually look like. This is Yunjin, an undergraduate, showing off one of our little bee colonies in a container ready to go into a tent full of canola. Um, here's what 18 tents in a field look like with different experimental treatments. A whole lot of bins of canola. You can see the um, colony up on that box on a stake and a strip of wildflower plants in this tent. So sunflowers, foxglove, penstemon, a few different things in there. And this was so much work, but it turned out to be really actually pretty cool. Our y-axis here is basically the, it says infection rate, it should say intensity, how many pathogen cells were in the gut. And we have our low transmission treatment, our canola, and our high transmission treatment, the letters above the mean show treatments that are different from each other. So A and B are different. In other words, putting high transmission plants in your wildflower strip can increase infection in bees over two weeks compared to using low transmission plants with just having canola is kind of in the middle. So that's interesting that um, what we plant might influence infection in the tent, but we also need to consider how are the bees doing? Um, and we could look at sort of survival of the adult bees and they survive better with wildflower plants in the tent, even though some of those wildflower plants increase infection. 
We can look at how many larvae the bees produce, basically any metric of bee performance that we looked at, the bees did better with wildflower strips in the tent, even if those wildflower strips also increased infection. This might not be a huge surprise. They were sort of confined to tents. They may have been more food limited than bees in natural settings would be, but it does show that we have to sort of consider multiple aspects when asking these questions. We also found, I'm not gonna show you the data, but if we, we had an estimate of how much nectar was sort of available in each one of these tents. And we found that, that the sort of the food resources available in the tent explained these treatment effects on performance. So nectar availability or resource availability in the tent explained bee survival, larval produced, all of that, but it didn't explain treatment effects on infection. We still see that the, head, the, the wildflower strip treatments are different in terms of infection, even after we account for food in the tent, some other mechanism is going on there. So you very politely, I think, I hope sat through this talk, but really, you know, you know like, well, what should we plant to save the bees? Um, I, I, this is gonna be, you're not gonna like this answer. I'd like to just acknowledge that nearly all of my work uses one bee species, one pathogen, a bee species that's not in decline. It's always annoying when scientists say we need more data, but I would not want to go out and tell people plant these plants and not those plants based on experiments that I've done with one bee species. I feel like that would not be a responsible thing for me to do. Um, also, when we're thinking about pollinator habitat, there's more considerations than just pathogen infection. We want resources for specialist bees, um, lots of specialists on sunflower actually. We want season long resources to support bees throughout the whole growing season. Um, and I will point out bees did better with more food, even if it did increase pathogens. So having these habitats, I think is better than not having them. Um, I wouldn't want these kind of data to sort of paralyze somebody from moving forward with creating habitat. What's next? Um, what I'd really like to do is manipulate plant species mixes in new pollinator habitat to be able to assess the effects on disease and pollinators more broadly, not just this one species. And I'm happy to report that I have a new National Science Foundation grant to do just that just started literally a few weeks ago. Um, we are looking for groups that would like to partner with us, groups that are already planning to create pollinator habitat. Ideally, if they have more than half an acre site, and I know that that may not be what farms are looking to do, um, but you know, homeowners, if there are farms that have this much land, um, organizations, I'd be very happy to talk where we might increase the amount of sunflower family plants in the mix you're planning to put in, or total floral density, we have some funds to help pay for that difference in cost. But also just if you're putting in a pollinator habitat of at least half an acre, I'd love to talk with you. Or even if you just have a low mow site where you're not doing any seeding, but you're mowing to manage for pollinator habitat. We will census for bees, measure pathogens on your site, and we would be happy to share our results with you. Um, so if you have a site like that, please contact me. I am in Western Mass. so. Um, if you're sort of in Southern Vermont, like there's sites in Southern Vermont that are closer to us than going to Boston say, but we, you know, logistics and distance is a consideration for us. And so thank you all for your time and attention. Thanks to many funding agencies and collaborators that have made this research possible. And yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that was super interesting. I think we'll, uh, we can take a minute here uh, if anybody has any questions or for or comments. Um, Berlin about what she shared, either in the chat or you can unmute. I've never really thought about the toilet bowl analogy. I'll, I'll never look at the face of a flower the same again. But that was so interesting about the idea of what what all is being communicated in those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting to think of all of the different kinds of interactions that are happening on flowers. Like, yeah, they're food, but there's also these pollen that can be reducing infection, but it's also like, think about how many insects are on flowers, right? How much sort of sharing and spreading and feeding is happening and the potential for flowers to be this, this site where germs are getting spread too. I mean, they're also really, really important because they're food, <laughs> but so many different things that are happening at that floral interface. Um, I had a question. Thank you for that um, comment. Um, sorry, I don't know if I missed this, but is was there a specific um, like varieties of sunflowers that are good for the bees, or just any kind of sunflower? Any kind. I mean, the only thing the only thing I want to acknowledge is like the, the kinds that are used for cut flowers often don't make pollen. 
And it's like, it's the pollen that seems to have that effect. But if it's a pollen producing sunflower, they all seem to work. We tried 17 different kinds. Um, <laughs> and they all, I mean, and, and that was like a bunch of different cultivars, but also like wild sunflowers from some different places and even things that were sort of different species of sunflowers, they all worked. Yeah, so you've got a lot of free range as long as it's pollen producing. We have a question from Vern in the chat. Are you suggesting certain pollinator habitat species cut flowers are preferable for participating in your study? If you've got the space, like if you're thinking of making new pollinator habitat and you're already gonna be investing those resources and you're close enough to me that we can get there in a reasonable amount of time, then I would love to talk with you. We have a lot of flexibility in the study. Great, Paul, I'm glad that you're enjoying this. And again, I put my email in there, but I'll put it in the chat as well. Please feel free to reach out to me or share my contact information. I have a flyer about this. Actually, we can attach. I'll put in the chat as well for anybody who is interested. I have a question about like the, the density at, at which the flowers were planted in mm -hmm. space that you were measuring. Mm -hmm. um, a question that I've gotten before is like, how much is enough? And right. that's a hard one to, <laughs> right, to right. answer, but and just in your in your experience and your research, what what does that look like for for this work? Yeah. And you're absolutely right. So like we ended up doing the sunflowers by abundance, like number of heads sort of estimated just because like they were really different densities. But at a yeah, if I was sort of a squint, we started to kind of see that benefits after around like a third of an acre or so. I mean, that's one farm, you know, but like bear in mind that bumblebees at least are, are traveling like in typically at least a kilometer. And so like, you know, while we were assessing one particular bat, you know, one particular farm and, and its site, you know, if there's multiple farms in an area and it's sort of adding up to around that much, then that I think it, it, that's about where, where we started to see effects. I mean, you know, that's statistically significant <laughs> effects. I like, you know, I still think doing something is probably better than doing nothing, but you know, it's sort of the lower end. We just can't pick up if the effects are really subtle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we can move on to our next presentation with Karen. And if anything comes up um, between now and the end, please feel free to continue using the chat and, and we'll have more time for um, more discussion after Karen's talk. Thanks for having me today. And it was um, really fun connecting with Laura about a month ago. And I've been so delighted to see the series. Um, and Lynn, thank you for your insights on um, these amazing dynamics um, amidst um, the work of our wonderful pollinators. Um, I'm Karen Trubit, and my husband and I run a, a really small farm, um, highly diversified, uh, kind of a traditional market farm, um, somewhere somewhere between, a, I think it's farming, somewhere between gardening and farming, about three or four acres, southwestern Vermont. And um, I titled this talk, Don't Worry, Be Happy, but my intention was not just was not, um, hey, everything's okay, guys. We don't need to worry about the bee situation. Um, I'm very concerned about um, what's happening with all of our pollinators, including bees. Um, and that said, I feel like in recent years, um, I have made a shift personally toward relaxing more about my farm management practices and in ways that help um, other communities thrive on our farm, not just the farm profitability or farm management. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our management practices and, um, and, and where the Bobby McFerrin don't worry piece comes in will be evident. Um, so um, among other things, we grow um, about 160 blueberries. So there's some flowering activity really early in the season that we wanna be supporting. Um, we grow cut flowers really from, I guess we have things blooming from May until November. Um, and then vegetables, we kind of grow year round. And um, there's the basic stats on our farm. Um, and we grow quite a range of flowers. Um, a lot of lysianthus, we have about four hoop houses. So 
you know, a fair amount of flower activity happens in one or two of the houses each year. Um, but we also have a lot of vegetables that do flowering. And so we want to support those pollinators as well. And this is just a quick overview of the farm. And I want to talk about, uh, this is kind of an old photo, but so there are a few more hoop houses down in this patch. Um, and I've circled here the, um, uh, a little border. There's kind of an awkward piece of land. There's kind of a farm road that runs along here. Sorry, I'm trying to get my laser working again. There we go. There we are. Um, so this is a little pollinator border. It's um, these are 120 foot long rows uh, through here. This is this uh, column one is maybe 80 to 100 feet. Uh, so we call this column two. There's a large 120 foot hoop house in here and another caterpillar. And then right in this neck of the woods, um, this area has been converted into a hedgerow, a permanent hedgerow. And I'll talk about some of the perennials that we populated there that are supporting a variety of farm helpers. Um, and then there's like this big hoop house here. Um, this area has 200 feet of grapes, which are very poorly managed, but there's a lot of golden rod in there and other habitat. The idea was just to kind of create some islands within the growing area. This shot is also really not especially representative of our current farming practice. I think it was a very hot, dry July. You can see our pond is kind of low. And it, we now are using a lot more tarp on our farm, but this was just a magic moment when in July when we uh, were putting a ton of cover crops and fall crops in, and we had really um, tilled up the fields and our farm never looks like this. This is shocking, <laughs> I tell you. Um, anyway, um, and then down in this area, we have some other flowering perennials and just a little bit of other um, permanent structure. There's a semi-permanent structure here and uh, just kind of sprinkling around happy places for um, beneficial insects to hang out. I'm gonna just zip right into the content here and not talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, so this is a photo of um, our largest perennial hedgerow. And this is a photograph of it fairly early season. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, the, the large bush right in the front is uh, Baptisia australis. It has a, kind of a dramatic spire of purple blooms that are out really early. They pair well with peony. And they're also quite deer resistant, as well as being a legume. So they are nitrogen fixing. So it's nice to have them in a uh, hedgerow like this because they can just kind of help support other guys along that lane. And um, we think of this as a, you know, I, I look to have continuous blooming in this area. And I might have either vegetable crops or flower crops alongside it um, any given year. I think there are onions or I think leeks planted next to a bed of carrots and you can see um, some arugula and lettuce beyond that. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that some of the guys that are going to help keep aphids down and um, other bad guys are gonna hang out here in this relaxed area that really isn't being cultivated in a strenuous way throughout the year. But um, I actually pull a ton of flowers off of these Baptisia plants. This is 120 feet long. Um, I have a, a separate patch in production, but I, I do have some nice delphinium in this bed. Um, and then we'll see other views of this at other points in the season as I click on. And so we've got delphinium, a little echinacea, a fair amount of yarrow, little flowers. So I've heard that bees and uh, really like flowers that have lots and lots that are comprised of lots and lots of little flowers. Um, we've got Rebecca, uh, two forms of Rebecca in this, the Herta and um, Triloba. And then I also use this as a place just to tuck extra plugs if I have like a half tray of Cosmos that didn't fit in the designated space for them. I'll just pop them into this area just to support, um, you know, this is also a place where snakes might hang out and which might be scary, but it's a great thing on the farm. Um, I feel like the more um, you know, we're using a lot of tarp these days and our vole population has increased. So we've got to get more snakes going. And then here's a shot of that 
same area, not such a pretty day. And uh, yeah, this is actually, I think the very same year as that other photo, but you can see it's really shifted. And now we've got the echinacea and yarrow and, uh, and you can see a Christmas tree farm there. <laughs> so in the background. Um, another thing now getting back to the theme of don't worry, um, I, I can remember standing in our field and seeing dandelions and like the weeds taking over in a wet spring one year and thinking, oh no, we've ruined our fields, but um, everything, yeah, things have survived, things have thrived. And so in this photograph, I show how um, sure um, we don't always stay on top of our mowing on the edges of the farm, but it's really a happy thing to have all of those dandelions in bloom um, in late May and into June, as we're wanting to also be supporting what's going on with um, um, the blueberries. And I will put some really early dandelions some springs. We've got a lot of dandelions. Um, I know some farms are practicing, uh, I know there's kind of been a promotion of no mow May to kind of help with meadows and more habitat. And we have a lot of, we've been kind of mowing around milkweed on our farm for a few years. so. We're on 30 acres of land and we now have some really beautiful milkweed stands and I have a ton of Joe pie weed. And so we really look to support some of those other sources on the farm. And, and then also on that, so I, I've stopped worrying as much about how sloppy our farm looks at times. And one of the things we always said when we started growing and we grow using organic practices, we're not certified, but we, the idea has just been, we try to plant enough to feed everyone. And that, I guess on some level goes for the insects too. And um, when we are managing our harvesting of flowers, if there are flowers that are not perfect, that don't meet our quality standards for, um, for our florist customers or for market bouquets, um, we'll often just leave things on the plant if it's not something that is like a cut and come again, but if it's something that is a one cut. So we'll just leave that there for the few weeks until we reach the point where we're going to be flipping beds. And I used to be like, uh, I used to think um, my sophistication as a farmer was somehow um, uh, measured by how quickly we flipped a bed when it was ready. And, you know, I hear farms talk about, yeah, we harvested that crop at, you know, 7 a.m. and we flipped the bed at 2 p.m. And, um, and that's great. And at our farm, it's, that, that would never happen. <laughs> uh, we'd like it to, but then someone calls in sick and we end up not flipping the bed for a week or two or even longer. And um, so I'm just going to think of that as great habitat for our pollinators. The farm does support about six months of blooming, um, kind of starting with the, the big show of ranunculus and anemone, although we don't do a huge amount. We don't do tulips. We don't do, you know, some of the spring things that a lot of people do. And then, um, you know, for farms, there are lots of um, autumn treasures to be had. You know, dahlias are spectacular. Um, I wonder how, you know, pollinator friendly they are. Um, I, Lynn's work is just kind of bubbling up in my head here as I think about what, what we have there in the fall, but you know, we have tons of goldenrod on our property, um, asters are amazing, and, and we have things kind of going sometimes in the hoop house, but sometimes even just in the broader fields. I think we were still cutting from the fields around October 23rd this past year. So stage of harvest is so important to farmers, uh, to flower farmers, um, and I think that uh, dialing in on stage of harvest, that has been like the education of my 18 years of growing at True Love Farm, kind of understanding the correct stage of harvest for things at what point flowers will have their lo uh, greatest longevity. And sure, for many of them, uh, we want to get in and cut them before pollination occurs. That said, there are any number of things we grow on the farm and that are really popular and are good profitable crops, but that um, actually can be just as valuable um, post-pollination as they are pre-pollination. And uh, this image is of nigella. This is nigella delft blue, which I do prefer in the flower form. Um, we grow the Albion and uh, the Love in a Mist uh, nigellas, and those um, are really fabulous and magical in the 
pod form. And I think of like bread seed poppies is another example of that. And poppies, they're up early, so they're available early, but they become really fabulous in pods. And here you can see uh, Scabia cystillata or star flower. Um, uh, another one we can, you know, Stelio, Scabiosa is quite cold tolerant, so we can have it out in the fields, I think, through a light frost in early October, and then still have fun pods coming in later. Um, here I highlighted a couple of the, what I think of and what I've read of as more bee-friendly flowers in New England. And, you know, I know that the shape of flowers informs, I've heard that, um, some of the double forms of flowers, the super double hybrids um, have become less bee friendly because it's harder for them to access the pollen. But um, that said, we do grow like, so I think Rebecca triloba is probably better than Sahara, which is Rebecca herta. But, um, you know, globe thistle is an amazing cup flower. It's been very, very popular. We have a large, uh, I think I have about 80 feet of it. Um, and I do probably cut about 80% of my crop of globe thistle and I wanna take it right before po pollination or there might just be a touch of pollination on the top. But, um, but probably 15% of those globe thistles are not going to be of the quality I want for my florist, for example. And so I leave them on the plant. This is, you know, you get one shot with globe thistle annually. So it's okay for those not perfect blooms just to stay on the plant. Not, you don't have to take everything off. And I think a lot of people just want to cut through a patch, take everything off. But I think with training our workers to, uh, to keep that on, we can provide, you know, in, 15% of 80 per, uh, an 80 foot bed of globe thistle, there's a fair amount of flower activity going on there that can still support others if we just manage it well. And then I just added some of the other obvious suspects here. I wanted to show a photo of kind of what one little patch on the farm would look like. We tend to, uh, I'll, I'll kind of create zones with flowers amongst our vegetable crops. Um, so this is probably one of four or five patches on the farm. Um, and this was a couple of years ago. And I think I had my flowers here last year though too, some flowers over here. But anyway, um, you can see on the right what I had cut that day, including like the Lysiantis were in the hoop house just beyond these, the field here. But you can see we do not have spiffy management. And in the middle of that second row of flowers where it's lighter, I think that that was all a bunch of spent uh, gypsophila, um, what is that, baby's breath. And I ended up not liking it. I it just, I didn't like using it. And so, and I could have just ripped it up and I probably should have, a little of it might've gone to seed. It's never come back, but uh, you know, I just left it sitting there while some other things were happening around it. Um, most of the sunflowers we grow are pollenless, but, you know, I think uh, hearing Lynn's information, I just like the idea of sprinkling more sunflowers around our farm um, just to cheer us along. Um, and then I wanted to point out our um, NRCS funded pollinator border. I showed a, when I showed the overhead shot of the farm, um, that small stretches up at the top of column two. It's 120 feet long, but it's maybe only 30 or 40 feet wide at the top, at the widest portion. It's kind of a triangle shape. You know, we just kind of prepped the ground and I would guess that we spent about $400, which was paid for out of one of our NRCS grants. Um, and it has been, you know, delighting us for maybe seven or eight years. This photograph was probably taken around year three. We had a, a professional photographer on the farm that morning, and she was a lot more interested in the pollinator border than most of our other crops. <laughs> so I was a little insulted, no, not really. But um, it, she took some really wonderful images, and I listed here um, some of the ingredients of that pollinator patch. And I just like to more regularly get in there and drop a few more umbels in there just because I like the idea of all those little flowers. Um, and it has, it is now being dominated by the echinacea and monarda. It's kind of fun to see them dueling as we get into the later part of the season. Um, and then this photograph 
shows, uh, just to kind of show the context, you can see our three-dimensional fencing to keep the deer out. And um, so this is, I'm standing in the pollinator border during that magnificent ice storm of two weeks ago. And, uh, and those I think are cone flowers. <laughs> and, uh, but here you can see the pollinator border just really abuts the top of column two. So it's great habitat. And then again, just another, our farm is a wreck, but it's okay. And we still produce tons of beautiful flowers. Um, we have, um, you know, there are oftentimes weed control issues. Um, but, uh, and this is actually a patch of flowers. I think they were the earliest to go in that year. They were, they were up near the top of column two. And um, you can see over in the right corner, right lower corner, those were snapdragons that were probably my first flush of snapdragons. And then, you know, they were chopped down, they kept producing and I just let those grow on. Now I clearly, I've got, you can also see tons of weeds and, you know, some fried buclearum or something like that but and all of that should have been taken out sooner but it, in the meantime it was providing you know and actually Ben, i think you took this photo it's the rare photo of Stephen and i together but here again you see that hedgerow in column two the uh, 120 foot long perennial hedgerow and at that point this is much later in the season and uh, maybe it's late july or early August, and um, at that point, that's Rebecca, um, the Saharas or something uh, in the background, and probably the Yara was going to town still at that point. So anyway, that's what I have to offer, just kind of a view of uh, at the ground level, what we're, how we're thinking about bees and um, not worrying as much, but supporting and creating a collaborative environment for all of the important team members in our farm ecology. Thank you. Thank you so much. A comment or question, uh, seeding rates for different mixed pollinator species is always a question that either follows crop selection inquiries, or maybe the first question when folks seem to know what species they are after. So yeah, um, I get that question a lot too, and I'm I'm learning as well in terms of you know what do I plant, <laughs> what's the best, and Karen, your your selections in in the different kind of pollinator zones or flower zones or hedgerows, those are were they based on just um, your market and kind of what you could also use in that, or was there another way in which you selected your flowers? Actually, I was given uh, a, a couple of Baptisia plants and I divided them, which is not easy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, they'd grown on in a couple of other places on the farm. And, um, but then when I decided I really wanted to buckle down and get at least one of those hedgerows in place, um, they were just something I had available of, perennial that was thriving on our farm, thriving in our soil. So I um, put in, I, I divided them up. And uh, so it was, and I'll, so it's been pretty random what's gone in there. I did a little research and thinking about it. Um, in my case, uh, I think I did them all with, aside from the Baptisia, I suspect I grew everything from seed. Um, everything that's in that patch, I could, you know, I, I didn't go out and get a lot of, um, I, mean, I, I wish I had more fun woodies for cut flower production. And if I had it to do again, I probably would have been a little more strategic about it being um, more of a profit center <laughs> as well as a delightful hedgerow of, of habitat for uh, beneficial insects. But um, it was just, it was more random than that. Great, thank you. Uh, Jenny, do you have a question? Um, yeah. So do you let a lot of flowers uh, go to seed so they like keep reseeding and like perpetuating themselves? Uh, yes and no. Um, we tend to move things a fair amount on the farm. We rotate all of our crops. And because flowers are maybe 30 or somewhere between 30 and 40% of what we grow, um, uh, we tend to move things around. I have a few patches where I will let things reseed. Um, uh, just annuals that like to recede, but for the most part, I don't count on that. I, I, for the most part, I just 
see, we have a you know pretty nice greenhouse setup, so I um, tend to uh, I tend to grow most things from transplants, move most things into the field at the transplant stage. So I, I don't direct seed all that much, um, and I and just as far as freely seeding, trying to think of a few things. Yeah, just because of how we prep our, our rows and stuff, for the most part, I don't. Yeah. There is a, a question in the chat from Stephanie that says, Karen, could you talk about the installation method for the pollinator border? Yeah, um, that is something my husband could speak to better. He did the prep. Um, but I know that we did, um, you know, once we said, oh, yeah, we'll do that, because we did it as part of an NRCS grant, I think, you know, we were planning for it. And so I, we might have even tilled that ground, put it into a cover crop the, the fall before we planted into it. And then we did that spring, because um, it, it was a really weedy edge of the farm. And we wanted to have those flowers have a chance <laughs> at really getting established and throwing down some seed uh, before in their first year, because we knew that first year was really important to, you know, getting a nice mix of things into that border. So I, so anyway, I think into cover crop in the fall before, and then uh, it's a, a little cultivation there. Um, and it, it was probably tilled at that point, eight years ago, we probably tilled that before we seeded. Yeah. I'm not sure we would do it quite that way. I don't think we would do it quite that way now because we are using less tillage, but yeah. Is there any, um, has there been any maintenance that you've had to do in that pollinator border or is it just kind of, just let it be? <laughs> we kind of let it be, yeah. Um, it's, uh, like I said, I'm noticing this little, you know, it's definitely, we're losing a few of the guys. So I, I probably, I probably will get in there and sprinkle. I think I sprinkled a little poppy in last year and just, and I don't even know if it, if it came up, you know, so, you know, I, I poke around in there once in a while. It's funny though, um, having a resource like the pollinator border on the farm, uh, it's not just for our pollinators. There have been a handful of times where we had a big order and um, Coreopsis is really beautiful. And I had something to do for someone and they only needed the flowers to last. It was for an event or something, but I ran up and the Coreopsis had been blooming about a week, but I could still identify what were the, you know, the just opening um, available cuts. And so, um, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the pollinator a couple of times has, has been a, a revenue source, <laughs> not a huge one, but a little bit of one. Uh, and, you know, if we had, uh, I think, you know, we, it probably would be good to go in. I'd like to actually even just put a, a stretch of some towering, um, nice and um, uh, sunflowers with pollen up in that patch too, just to have them join the party. It really is a, a nice little patch. It, one of uh, when you think about your farm's layout, you know, in our case, um, we tend to enter our fields um, on a corner, but um, that pollinator border, if we come in like the next gateway, not, not the main gateway, but the next one, the pollinator border is right there. We go in and out of there, uh, out of that entrance on our scooter or on the tractor more regularly. So it's also there just to help lift us up as well as the pollinators. And I think if you can scope out those opportunities on your land to just beautify the environment, I think that's really important. And, you know, the, that border is, uh, it's not just a visual highlight, but there are times we walk by and you can just, just as we can with many other patches of flowers on the farm, but you really hear the hum of the bees in the afternoon. and. It's really exciting. Oh, and I forgot to mention one other thing. Speaking of um, afternoon and bees, um, I, I talked about the dandelions in that shot of Stephen mowing, but we are really strict about our mowing here. Early on in our time at the farm, we had a crusty old Vermonter who was a beekeeper who kept honeybees on the property. And 
he just had a number of little pearls to impart. I think he probably is the person who first raised our awareness of opportunities. Um, but you know, he he said he would never mow in the morning because that's when the bees are more active. And so as a as a policy, we don't mow before noon and we rarely mow even before 4 p.m. Um, I just I I don't want I, I don't want a lot of bees around when I'm mowing. And in part, I think I became more sensitive to that because when we just started out here 18 years ago, um, one of my first times on our when on our big tractor and, and mowing, which was not part of my life living in the suburbs of Minneapolis, <laughs> with a, uh, living on a corner lot. Um, but I was up on the big mower uh, on the tractor and I ran over a baby bird. And it was so depressing for me. And I think ever since then, I just am very conscious of what happens with mowers and the destruction of habitat. And so, you know, we're, we're a pretty frowsy little farm, um, but it's, you know, but we like it <laughs> that way. And I, um, I've actually decided, I, I was kind of embarrassed about the way the farm looked for a while. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that to a group of farmers because <laughs> you all get it. but. Um, uh, I now want to have more people out to the farm just to educate them on um, how we can live more um, in consideration of the needs of um, those with whom we share the environment. So um, it, it kind of makes me crazy seeing people mowing their lawn every five days in a wet summer and um, just for all the creative time loss for those people, but also for the incredible destruction of habitat, so. Um, can you describe the process of applying for the, um, was it an NRCS grant for the pollinator border? Um, do you have to be in production for a certain number of years or how did that all work? I'm not sure um, how that works. You know, I think that um, the pollinator border was built into one of our, um, is it the equip program EQUIP? And you should maybe just make contact with your NRCS office. I know we we work with the Rutland office, and I don't know. Are you in Montpelier, Jenny? I feel like you and I had a nice little exchange, I think, on the listserv last a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, may, may I jump in? Um, I'm oh. Sarah Jansen, and I'm a, I work for NRCS, and. Um, I'm making the switch from the Middlebury, Vermont office to the Berlin field office, which is where you are, Jenny. Oh, um, okay. And so um, the, the best thing to do is to um, contact your local NRCS office. There's usually one in almost every county or definitely one in every state. Um, and talk to a soil conservationist that through the EQIP program, there's um, the conservation cover or wildlife um, habitat planting um, practice and, or field border, I don't know. It can kind of be worked into a couple of different, worked in in a couple of different ways. And um, the soil conservationist would come out and talk to you and look at the farm and start like figuring out how to make it happen. and going through the competitive equip process to see if there's also some money that could be attached to that. Well, that's good to know, thanks. They're such a great resource. And I wanted to mention too, Jenny, that's also where you'd look you know, like for a high tunnel. And I think that when we received it for the pollinator border, it was built into um, adding another high tunnel. And we might've even done some irrigation work as part of that particular grant. So it's. Oh, a great way of another way of, um, of looking at the larger ecosystem needs and they're a great resource for us. That was all under the equip grant. I believe so. Um, we've done an equip grant. I think we've done two or three equip grants and maybe two. And then one of them was under a different program and I don't remember that one. Um, and that was actually when something happened with our equip application. So yeah. And I have to admit, I yeah, I'm, I'm glad someone from NRCS is here because we haven't really done anything for a few years. So I don't know what's going on with that funding. One thing to say is that the way each state runs their 
their programs and their funding cycles and is different. So Massachusetts and Vermont and whatever other states up here um, are represented here, like you should really talk to someone local, but there are a couple of different funding options, EQIP and uh, also the conservation stewardship program is really good for farms that are practically perfect <laughs> and want to do more. Um, but 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 like like you said, um, high tunnels, cover crop, um, uh, irrigation, um, seeding down problematic areas to like long term perennial, you know, hay or pollinator habitat. Um, a, a lot of different soil testing, nutrient management plans. There's a lot, there's a lot going on that. NRCS would like to help small farms with. Um, so please um, Google us, find your local office. And that's a good segue because um, we're at one o'clock now and next week we will be talking a little bit more about um, potential NRCS and pollinator plantings and um, speaking with a grower who also has experience with, with those um, relationships with NRCS and um, how they've employed pollinator plantings on their farms so and, and beneficial insect planting. So, um, so tune in next week for that. Um, and otherwise, just want to, um, yeah, respect the time and thank our speakers. Thank you so much for your time and energy that you put into this today and um, thank you to everybody who was able to join us and for anybody who might be watching this recording, thank you for tuning in and um, look forward to seeing folks next week. So thank you so much.